wondering, sir, if he were in the right part. No, which way to go? For what? Work. Hey, uh, ma'am. Should have thought of that before you shipped, lad. I don't know anybody in town that's looking for help. I would work for scraps, sir. Sorry, lad. Oh, God! Clumsy oaf dirtied my trousers. Then we shall make him pay for a laundress, Captain. You, come around to the headquarters of the 14th West Yorkshires in the morning. And I want you to bring sufficient money so that... Pay attention when a king's officer gives you an instruction. Unless you prefer the message be delivered in a more memorable way. Ah, a scrapper. Ah, that is fine with me. He's probably sporting a liberty medal under those stinking clothes. He's certainly insolent enough to be one of them. Do I have your leave to thin their ranks slightly, sir? As you wish. Ah! Oh! Stay your hand, sir. You made one mistake, sir. No need to make another. What started this, lad? Well, sir, I, I happened to splash mud on the captain's trousers. It was an accident. Say, you see what he's done to my face? Oh. Improved it considerably, I'd say. I would remind you where you are, sir. Salutation is crowded with good friends, but if you truly wish to engage, I can guarantee a substantial part of the North End would be here after your heads before three blows are struck. Uh, leave off, Stark. Sir, I refuse to cower in front of these... I said leave off, or you'll have a cut on your throat to match the one on your face. One of these days we'll have laws to hang, you rebel scum. Aye, there'll be hangings right enough. But it'll be your necks that are stretched under the liberty tree. Good work, lad. Come along. Oh, and uh, thank you, friends. And there'll be one round of drinks served in the salutation. Compliments of Will Campbell. Yeah. <laughs> Here you are, lad. A mug of ale for you. And Jeremy, fetch a goodly bowl of chowder from the kitchen and some brown bread. Aye, sir. That go well with you, lad. You will never know, sir. Well, we do know it was a bold thing you did out there. Most men would have truckered, I can tell you. Well, sir, I may have acted out of ignorance. I've only just come to Boston City. And half dead from the experience, no doubt. Well, I have been trying to find work, sir. What's your name, lad? Philip Kent, sir. Runaway bondsman? No, sir, a free man. Can you prove it? Only with my word. I think maybe there's something we can find for you to do here at the salutation. <laughs> Every young lad who tweaked Tommy's beak, eh? 
You could use a new roof, Will. Aye, that I could, Ben. Are you good at carpentry, Philip Kent? Well, I'm sure I could learn, sir. I have used a hammer. Good. But, well, what I really am is a printer. What's that? A printer? Yes, sir. You've served your apprenticeship, did you? With Sholto and Sons, London. Sholto? Will? Let your roof leak. I'll take this one off your hands. If he is indeed a printer. Say hello to Benjamin Eads, lad, of Eads and Gill. I'm a bit out of practice, sir. I'm certain I could work faster. Do you have a place to live? No, sir, I do not. I suppose we could put a cot in the cellar? Well, thank you, sir, very much. It's hard work here. Dangerous work, judging by what's written here. The Gazette, what is it? The Voice of Dissent. And this author, Joyce Jr.? That's a pseudonym for Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams? He's a leader of what the uh, Tories call mobility. Well, I am familiar with that term, sir. Lord North once accused me of being a member. Lord North? Yes, sir. The, the Prime Minister uh, of England. You had an audience with him? Well, more of a chance encounter at my father's house. Now, see here, Philip. I must say I find it hard to believe that the lad who just arrived here in Boston penniless had an audience with the Prime Minister of England. Sir, it is true. You mind telling me how? That's a, my father was English, a nobleman. I am his son by a French woman he never married. A bastard son. I was to receive part of a fortune, and when I went to England to, to claim it, his family tried to kill me. So I escaped to America. Your mother is French. Why don't you go to her? She is dead too, sir. But, well, in London, I... I got to like being a printer. Being in the battle of ideas, as Mr. Sholto would say. And Dr. Franklin told me that I could find employment... Franklin? Benjamin Franklin? Yes, sir. For God, a prime minister and Ben Franklin, too? Well, sir, I believe it was Dr. Franklin's feelings about freedom that convinced me to come here most of all. The preservation of freedom requires a struggle. And more importantly, secrecy. How long have you been in America? Three days, sir. Barely. Man will never know whether he finds fortune or fortune finds him. But you must know that you have stumbled into something beyond your imagining. The Sons of Liberty. Our meeting place, the back room of the salutation. This press, our spokesman. Our purpose, the guarantee of liberty. There's great risk here, son. Are you prepared to accept it? Yes, sir, I am. Good. Then let us get a tot of rum while we haggle over the inequitable price that I'm going to pay for your services. What is it, sir? Johnny Malcolm. Well, who's Johnny Malcolm? He's a harmless old lunatic. You are here because the King of England saw fit to colonize this wonderful land. And you betrayed him. He gave you your home, gainful employment, and laws to abide by. When your tongue, Johnny Malcolm, will put the tar brush to it before we put it to your backside. <laughs> It'll be. He's just a senile old man. He means no harm. Tender your cream pus, Smithy. He bullied the Williams boy, and that's a fact. Upset his kingdom cut for no reason at all. Well, you're not going to hate him. He's a lot of you. And I will push over that little wart's wagon whenever I have a mind. I know his father is spreading sedition in Boston City. And if I split his head open, I will get ten shillings from the governor himself. <laughs> For all you yaksy traitors. You had a taste of the tar and feathers once, Johnny. This time we'll do it properly. Stand aside, Smithy. Diamond Man, if you're a friend of liberty, leave off torturing a helpless enemy. Let's get out of the way. Hit him back, Smithy! Hit him back! Do you sense me? Do you know 
idea what you do to the cars. Cause you give me cause, sir. Just... <laughs> Uh, nothing permanent. Animals. The rebel in such savagery. In the name of liberty. One of Mr. Adams' mobs? All they want is cruel sport. There's not a man in that pack who wears the Liberty Medal. Ben, get out a statement. Let Boston know we had nothing to do with this, and we'll see to those that see it. Done. Thank you for the hand, young man. Name is Revere. Paul Revere. Mr. Revere? Philip Kent. Paul is our resident silversmith. More importantly, he's the one man among us who can reach out to the artisans and mechanics in the town. Because I'm one myself. If you ever need a silver button replaced, Mr. Kent, my shop is on Clark Street. Well, I'm afraid I do not have many of those yet, sir. Yet? <laughs> Spoken like a real Yankee, eh, Ben? I think you'll find that he's one of us in uh, many ways. I hope so. See you at the salutation, Ben. I say you, Mr. Kent, having felt the sting of a mob, do you have second thoughts about working with the men who incite them to action? The truth, sir? I do not know if I'm ready to fight for your cause, but I think I understand it. Better than most, I imagine. England looks at all of us here as her bastard sons. We feel we are her true sons. We will somehow prove that. Welcome to America, Mr. Kent to a common cause. Will you see the rest of the pamphlets over to Goodale's by six? Yes, sir. That's one more thing, Dunn. Seems to be more and more to do. Yes, it does that, sir. Lucky we met that day, Philip. You've been of great service to me. You've also earned the respect and trust of others. Will Campbell, in particular. Mr. Campbell, at the salutation? He wondered whether you'd mind to serve the flip to the Sons of Liberty. Me, sir? I, in the back room. There's a few pence in it, a little extra money. What do you say? Well, to have a chance to serve men like Samuel Adams, sir, I would be most honored. Good, I'll pass that along. And don't forget, uh, good deals by six. Yes, sir. Mr. Reed's driving off. Yes, it was. Oh, damn. Well, is there something I can help you with? Are you a new apprentice? Well, I worked for Mr. Reed's so on wages, but I'm not bound to him or to anyone. This is copy from my father to be set immediately. I trust the writing has your approval? Yes, it seems excellent. And I agree with your father's appeal to establish a committee of correspondence, Mistress Ware. Do you? I wasn't aware an ordinary devil approved or disapproved copy. I will pass this material on to Mr. Reeds the moment he returns. Good day. Thank you. I... I did address you sharply. But this article's very important. The matter of Mr. Hancock's reluctance to give his support to Mr. Adams' plan? Yes, I would say that is terribly important. But I'm sure your father's usual fine phrasing will help persuade him. You're familiar with his writing? If we print it, I read it. My name is Philip Kent. As soon as the material has been proofed, my father would welcome a message to that effect if you will so notify Mr. Eve. Please. What? If you will so notify Mr. Eads to that effect, please. Nervous. Hi, sir. Well, don't be letting the gentleman inside see that job. Could be mistaken for something else. Sir? 
any of the words spoken behind that door were to be repeated, a lot of men's lives could be in jeopardy. And if you seem like the kind of person that might let something slip, so to speak, one of those lives could be your own. Still want to go in? Yes, sir. Harnessed together, which is the purpose of the Committee of Correspondence. I will vouch for the trustworthiness of this young man. Samuel, uh, this is the young man I mentioned, Philip Kent. Ah, yes. Friend of Dr. Franklin's. Well, sir, an acquaintance. And very much in his debt for encouraging me to come here. Well, we can always use recruits. And from what Benjamin here tells me, you've no love for the nobility. Well, not to those who treat ordinary people like property, sir. There is no other kind of nobility. You have a foolish consistency, Samuel. We have friends. Like the Earl of Chatham, you can't just dismiss him because he's an Earl. Principius Obster, Dr. Warren. Principius Obster, take a stand at the start. The first appeasement only leads to others, be assured of that. And at the very moment that we have no issue, to stir up the citizens of Boston to our purpose, we are delivered with two. Two! Since June. And yet, you hesitate. It is unforgivable. No, Campbell. Let him stay. If we hear any of our remarks abroad tomorrow, we'll know who to blame. We can trust him. He was with Mr. Eads and myself when the mob ran poor Johnny Malcolm into the tar pit. He stood with us, against a lot of them. Yes, well, there you have the crux of the problem. Now, how the devil can it be us against them when we all sink or swim together? The only answer is to provoke them. I don't think it possible to provoke a populace that's grown complacent with the present prosperity. It is possible. We must hammer at them daily with issues. Yes, such as the announcement by the royal governor Hutchinson that commencing next year, his salary will be paid not by the provincial congress, but by the crown. The working man doesn't care who pays the governor. And since these last taxes have been rescinded... But not the damn tea tax. Ah, uh, well, now there. We have a thorn for everyone's side. Magnify it out of all proportion if we have to. But use that single issue to seize advantage. Confrontation and conflagration will surely follow. Now, as soon as the citizens understand that and accept it... Samuel, you are a manipulator. And I will never agree that conflagration, your prettified term for open rebellion, for war, is inevitable. Well, then, sir, you are blind. No, sir, you are a manipulator. You are determined to take us to war. German George dictates our course. And I say, let it be the last dictate that he delivers to these colonies. Samuel is right, Philip. Dr. Warren may say what he will, but it's there for all of us to see. We are headed for war. <laughs> I'm sure it's an inconvenience, Mr. Ware, it is to all of us, particularly to Sergeant London. And I'm sure we'll all get used to the arrangement. Other homes have and more will. And you do have room to accommodate at least one of us, if anyone does. I'm sure you must know I conduct a goodly portion of my business from my home, though, Captain. I can't be having strangers about while clients are discussing confidences. We are well acquainted with your business, Lawyer Ware, and your political persuasion. But there will be no breach of faith as a result of the sergeant living with you as long as you keep faith with the Crown. And as for strangers, well, uh, perhaps I might put your mind at rest on that score by permitting me to call upon your daughter. It isn't my permission that's needed in that matter, Captain Stark. It's the young lady's. And the granting of that is an impossibility. You have no control over your daughter's behavior, sir. Excuse me. We have a visitor, sir. Oh, it's Mr. Kent from the printing house. Do come in, Mr. Kent. I believe you know my father. Yes, indeed. How do you do, sir? And this is our new house guest, Sergeant Ludmer, was it? Ah, uh, London, mum. House guest? Oh, well, uh, just for a while, mum. You see... Uh... London! Sir! Mr. Ware expects no apology. 
I'm sure none is owed his servant. Uh, sorry, sir, I only thought to die. See to your quarters and your tongue. Yes, sir. The spare room, Daisy? Yes, ma'am. Follow me. Very nice to meet you, sir. Oh, and you, Sergeant. And this is Captain Sparks. A Stark. Yes, I believe we've met before. Congratulations on your promotion, Captain. Your daughter keeps company with mechanics. By preference. Boston is not so large that we will not meet again, mechanic. My pleasure. Your servant. <laughs> they all think their uniforms make them the catch of the day. Our thanks to you, Mr. Kent. We couldn't get rid of him, even with outright rudeness. I thought your greeting was for practical purposes. How is it you're acquainted with a lobster back, Mr. Kent? We argued once, sir. About what? The scar on his face. Did you put it there? I've brought the proofs for you, Mr. Ware. I hope it wasn't too untimely. Not at all, lad. I'm anxious to look at them. I suppose I should apologize for my behavior at the printers. I suppose you should. I... I, I don't... I accept. Oh, you told the captain that you kept the company of mechanics by preference. And I intend to hold you to your admission. Might I call upon you some Sunday? Perhaps for a walk on the common, or I could rent a boat? It seems I have trapped myself, haven't I? It seems so, Mistress Anne. You are impertinent. But tell your father that I will be back in an hour for those proofs. And I will call for you on Sunday. Have you by chance made the acquaintance of Lawyer Ware's daughter? And Ware? What about her? Oh, I was just wondering. Nice looking young woman. Uh, inclined to have a sharp tongue. Yes, so I discovered. It's my opinion that Abraham has allowed her too free an access into his library. It's going to take a man with backbone and a large fist to wed and bed that one. She's already past marriageable age, uh, no regular bows, much to her father's chagrin. I think he fears she may become a spinster. Well, sir, I find it hard to believe that someone isn't oh, courting her. Would you like a wife smarter than you? Well, I never considered it, sir. Oh, by the way, Miss Treats, would it be possible for you to grant me, say, uh, a small advance on my wages? I find no inhibiting consideration. You want to buy something? Yes, sir. Benjamin? This must be printed up immediately. Outrageous affront to Englishman's liberties. What's this? Well, it's happened. <laughs> Rumors are true. Lord North is inviting disaster, and he's giving us precisely what we hope for. In what manner? With tea. Cutter brought the news this morning. A bill passed in London not a month ago, granting the East India Company a virtual monopoly in the colonial tea trade. Even paying taxes on this side, the company can undercut the prices of law-abiding Tory merchants. But why would the Crown strike at the merchants? The very heart of the element that supports it. Because they're fools. But they did do it and gave us a weapon to turn even the most loyal followers of the king against him. Now we have an issue with real teeth. And they're going to feel the bite of it. Every man jack. I promise you, in a year, perhaps less, we'll have what we wanted. War. Precisely. I think Mr. Adams is right. The people of all the colonies are going to have to make a choice. Whatever happens in Boston is eventually going to happen everywhere. At least some progress is being made. My father says there's a man named Jefferson from Virginia, who's as committed as any man to the cause.
And what about you? Are you committed? Yes, I am. Why? Because of your father? I have other reasons. Meaning? I intend that liberty should apply to me, too. Not just to men. Why should I have to retreat from the world just because I'm a woman? The lady sounds angry. There has to be more to life than having babies and kitchens and seeing polish on hardwood floors. Plunging into politics? Hoping to be part of my husband's work someday. When I know who he is. What's the matter? I've loved no man yet, Philip. Not that way. I want you, Anne. I want you too. Then... There has to be more. I'm sorry. I am too. I cannot give you what you need, Anne. Not now. Because you don't know if what you need is here, or back in England? Someday you'll know, Philip. I can wait. Threatened with this more time than I can count. It was the Tories then. Oh, they're too afraid of the Sons of Liberty to risk after dark villainy. They know they'd likely never get home again. It would be the soldiers coming across from the garrison at Castle William. The right honorable king's men. Thinking that they might silence our protests over the tea with a little hooliganism. Well, we'll have to print again tomorrow. They appear to have destroyed about a third of the run. It came close to destroying the only place I have to build a future. Here. You earned this tonight. Wear it proudly. Noble birth or not, you're one of us now. And it's time we all took action. Enough for ten men. Well, I do not think blankets and feathers will fool anyone. We're not trying to fool anyone, Philip, but there are men with us who can't afford to risk discovery. Besides, these rags can be shed quickly if we have to run for them. It's Captain Ross. There he is. Quiet. Hear what he says. Captain. Have you called upon the governor? Oh, I have. And what is his disposition in this matter? His Excellency repeated that he cannot give me a pass to sail from the arbor unless my vessel is cleared from the customs house. With the duty on the tea paid. No! 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 Captain, it is the will of the citizens that your cargo of tea be returned to England. We will not have it on our shore. However, if you do not sail on the next tide, the Crown claims the right to seize your vessel and the tea. Therefore, sir, you must sail. Right! I cannot possibly do so! It would prove my ruin to pay the tax. Well, then it would seem we have but one choice. To find out how well tea mingles with salt water. No matter what transpires, from this time forward, let it be remembered. 
that no one shall attempt any harm on the good captain here or his vessel. Now to the harbor, let's brew some tea. So, did you have a fine evening for your Indian raid? <laughs> well, the mechanic. I thought I recognized you under that blanket. Not only do you insult his majesty's officers, but you flout his law. <laughs> I guess I could bring you in front of a magistrate, but I think I would prefer a more personal justice. And while you're rotting here with the dogs picking over your bones, I will be calling upon the young lady again. Think of that while you're bleeding to death, eh? I waited till father was asleep. What about the sergeant? He was called to the harbor. And you cannot be found on the streets tonight of all nights. I will see you home. No. Philip, I saw you leave. I thought what could happen. I had to... Philip. It is nothing. You're bleeding. Anne, let's go. I won't leave you like Anne. this. Anne. Inside, Philip. Inside. We heard there'd be no trouble at Griffin's Wharf. There wasn't. This is from a knife or a sword. It has no relation to Mr. Adams' tea party. It's just something that happened, and it's over now. Oh, Philip. All I could think about when I saw you leave tonight is how I've been prattling on about the future. When the most obvious thing is that we may not have any future at all. And Tonight I knew what I had to do come here and say what I've never said to anyone before. And I don't think... I want to, Philip. Without any conditions, or promises, or pledges about tomorrow. I want to. Even if it's only for this one night. Take well to the militia. Well, thank you very much, sir. My father was a soldier. This is a reserve company. We have three units which we consider front rank. If you'd be interested, I could propose you for one of those. I would consider it a privilege, Colonel Knox. You would, of course, be required to supply yourself with a musket. The current brown bess in use by the King's men would do nicely. We're not overly curious how a man acquires a gun so long as he has one, if you follow me. I do indeed, sir. Your wife sent me with this. It was just posted. Damn them to hell. What is it, sir? New bill just passed Parliament. The province of Massachusetts 
is to be punished for destroying the tea. As well as for her long and open rebelliousness against Crown authority in general. This bill forbids the loading or unloading of any cargo in Boston Harbor, effective June 1st, 1774. Well, we've received reports that the British Naval Squadron is already seeing to the completeness of the blockade. We'll survive. The city can be supplied by land across the neck. New York, the other colonies are sure to help. I pray God you're right. If that's not the case. These intolerable acts will mean the end of Boston. The end? On the contrary. Do you know what the outcome will be if the ministers continue to make laws to punish us? Do you know where the road will lead? Armed resistance. More than that. United resistance. And then, independence. I speculated who among us would be the first to speak that word. What made you say that, son? I do not know, sir. A talk I had with a friend, I suppose. I guess it's been on all of our minds. I suppose it's been on Samuel's mind the longest, eh, sir? It has. And I will accept nothing less. It is not as much as Samuel, or Dr. W, or indeed myself would have wished. On the other hand, to be here in Philadelphia, to be among the delegates who foregather at City Tavern at nightfall, and to hear such gentlemen as the very respected Colonel Washington of Virginia voice the same concerns as the men of Boston. That, my dearest daughter, is an experience not capable of being fully described, only savored in the proud heart. Your father's a good man. You must be proud he was chosen. Yes, I am. And so is he. Does he say when he might return? No. Thankfully. As much as I miss him, I think I'd miss this time alone more. We'd best get back. In time. Anne, we can't. Yes, we can! <laughs> 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 oh, so oh. Daisy? Come here. Come. Come. Miss Anne? Oh. Miss Anne? Oh. 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 Don't uh, think ill of Daisy, Mistress Ware. Or you, Mr. Kent, sir. It was me who made her. George! I mean... It's uh, all right, Daisy. It's all right. I uh, just don't know what got into us, sir. I mean, into me. I took complete advantage of the poor girl. Oh, Daisy, please forgive me. Please forgive me. George, get up. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, my love. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah. <clears throat> uh, truth is, Mr. Swear, I've been meaning to speak to you for quite some time now. If, uh... If I can speak in confidence. Well, of course you can, Sergeant. That's it. The Sergeant part. That's what's wrong. What's between us. This blasted army. I'm going to leave it. You know, it's treason to talk that way. I'm not talking about resigning. Desertion? Sir, when I first came to Boston, even though I hated the fact I was here to repress fellow Englishmen, I would have struck down any chap who said I might run away. But I don't mind admitting that my feelings for Daisy have changed my attitude about everything. We're going to be married, sir. My father has a farm, other side of Concord. George could hide there. And what about your uniform? Huh? Burn the uniform, I guess. And the musket? Musket? Musket and bayonet. My price for seeing you safely to Concord. It's yours, Mr. Kent. Philip. Philip. Yes, sir. You'll need a plan to get out of Boston. Well, you said we were going to a farm, so we'll go as farmers. Well, of course, we'll need different clothes, perhaps a horse and a cart. We could speak to Will Campbell at the salutation, see if he could help us out. How much you figure it costs? I'd say about five shillings should do it. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now then, who is the man? I don't know his name, sir. 
I only know he's quartered in Lawyer Ware's house on Launder Street. That would be Sergeant Lumden, sir. A sergeant, aye. Mr. Campbell's getting the cart for him in Kent. I must go, sir. Kent? Sir? The traitor, he calls himself Kent? Aye, sir. Describe him. Sir? His height, his likeness, his age. Describe him. Jeremy, you are right, lad. Aye, sir. Just slapped a bit over on the gentleman's sleeve while I was cleaning off the table. Be careful. Kent, tell me. Twenty, maybe. Not too big, nor too small. Fair of color. I don't know, sir. I... How long has he been in Boston? In Boston, sir? Talk, lad. And straight, or I'll have your tongue. The first time I saw him was over a year ago. I told Mr. Campbell he'd come in from Bristol on a freighter. Bristol? You certainly said Bristol. Aye, sir, Bristol it was. I've got to go, sir. What is it, Colonel? Are you all right? Colonel Amberley, what is this fellow Kent? Do you know him? The highwayman who left my hand this way. I'm told he calls himself by that name. And I know he fled from Bristol. Well, by God, we shall bring him in, then. No need, Major. I can take him alone. What if the deserter is with him? I said, I'll deal with it alone, Major. As you wish, sir. It's time. It's time that both our troops and the citizens of Boston learn the price of betrayal. I intend this incident to become a lesson. And I shall teach it personally. Philippe Charbonneau. Where is he? I told you I don't know anyone by that name. But you know the name Kent, don't you? Philip Kent. Get out. Oh, is he your lover? He has a way with women, I'm told. My wife was his lover once. Did he tell you about her? You're hurting me. And your Frenchman never hurts you? Strange. At least he told me he hurt her. Very deeply, she said, by leaving her after he'd known her pleasure. Please. Now, where is he? Get down, sir. Get down. What is it? Sir, an officer. Inside with Mr. Swear. Daisy saw him come in up. I run out the back to hide. They know. They know. Mr. Campbell would never tell anyone. And Jeremy, the boy who works for me in the salutation. He was sweeping up. He must have heard us. Sold us out. George, wait. Wait. Stay here. He did that to me. And he took Alicia while she was betrothed to me. What do you think I'll do to him? My father... Your father will do nothing. The general staff knows how this house is used to hedge treason. But perhaps when your lover learns what sweet pleasures I've taken here, he'll be as eager to seek his revenge as I am mine. Shower now. Outside. I will not spill your blood in this house. You dare to take the name Kent? I wrote Alicia about finding you. Told her about your long overdue death.
He was many things to me, but never a brother. Anne, are you all right? Yes. But he knew about you and about Sergeant London. If anyone comes here looking for him, your story must be that he never arrived. You never saw him, you never heard his name before they mentioned that. Do you understand? Yes, but, but what if I can't convince them? What if they... And we must move quickly and surely. Now, please, go find Daisy, get her to help you make things neat again. And London and I will get rid of his body. You can't still go to Concord. Not as we planned, anyway. If they know about us, then they know about the clothes and the cart. Now, hurry, please, get Daisy in London. Some soldiers a ways back. You know where to leave the cart? Yes. Mr. Kent, it doesn't tarry. Keep your pace. Well, everything tallies. This must be it. I wish Daisy would give me some kind of token, something that your father would recognize as hers. Word that she is safe is all you'll need to hear. That be far enough. We are friends. Not by the courts on your backs. I knew it. Daisy told me her father would just as soon shoot me as meet me in this uniform. Be quiet, George. Uh, the coats are borrowed, friend. We come from Boston. From, uh, from Daisy O'Brien. Mind whose name rolls off your tongue so lightly in her father's presence, Major. I don't give a tinker's damn about your rank. Or about the crown you bought it from. You were asked to state your business. Well, state it and be gone with you. Mr. O'Brien, uh, we are not at all what we seem, sir. Our real clothes are in Mr. London's pack. You packing. were told to stand fast. Sir, look, th this tear and the stain. I have no wound, sir, because the uniform is not mine. To what end do you wear it, then? Well, to seek shelter, sir. And Daisy told us we'd be safe here. Oh. Well, uh, and this, sir... Well, this was just to get us here without question. My name is Kent. Philip Kent. Sir? Master Charbonneau. Lucas? It is you. How you be? I am well, Lucas. Much better now. You know this man? I do that. But not by the name he gave me. No, sir. But uh, then I've had more than one name myself. But this man and I, we had one grand time on the Bristol Road. About two years ago, sir. Well, a lot can happen in two years to change a man. They could be just what they look like. King's men, hunting for military stores. Well, sir, I do not think you'll find one of the King's men wearing this. Because you have a medal from the Mother Church doesn't mean that you...
the Liberty Tree. You're one of the Boston band? I am. Could be stolen. It could be. But it isn't. So, when I couldn't find my brother in Virginia, I came north, met Mr. O'Brien. That still does not tell me why these two should come riding into here calling my daughter's name. Well, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. London here is a former soldier of the King's Infantry. And I, I helped him to escape. That doesn't explain Daisy. Well, sir, see, um... George. Ah, uh, well, the fact of the matter, sir, is, uh... Well, George and Daisy plan to marry. What? You come riding in here bold as brass, wearing those red coats, and bringing me the news that, that this is going to be my son-in-law? I know times are mad, but they are not that mad. Surely, sir, the story is much too impossible not to be true, eh? Well, I suppose so. If it's sanctuary you're seeking, the price is work. Well, we will gladly pay that, sir. Well, George plans no return to Boston, and well, I would like to stay myself. That is, if I may. Trouble with the Crown? Uh, there may be warrants for my arrest. It uh, wouldn't have anything to do with that coat you borrowed and those stains on it, would it? Yes, sir. Well, then why didn't you say so, lad? That's the best recommendation you could have. You're in excellent company. Do you know they tell me that even men like Johnny Hancock and Sam Adams, their life is not worth a shilling if they linger too many more days in Boston? You know that? Well, the fact is, we've been hearing that they might be headed this way. In your footsteps, as it were, sir. A true son of liberty has mustered into the militia. Hasn't he? Well, indeed I have, sir. The Boston Grenadiers under Captain Knox. Well then, since you're going to be staying, we must see that you get into Jim Barrett's company right away. Concord needs every man in this militia that it can get. Besides, we can use these coats for target practice. Eh? Eat, go on, eat, boys. All militia companies are hereby put on notice. The Provincial Congress has resolved that any troop movement from Boston by the British to the number of 500 men shall be considered grounds for mobilization to a war-ready state. Now there can be little doubt that we are but weeks away from war. Our alarm system using mounted couriers and church bells has been established. I consider you men ready to march at a moment's notice. Now any of you, not ready in heart and mind to accept open confrontation with His Majesty's Grenadiers, at best tell me now, Good. And let us assemble. Ah! Great news. Daisy's arrived from Boston. The big lummox, what a van. She's here too. At Wright's Tavern in Concord. They've taken rooms, her and her father. Everyone's fled Boston. Everyone. been difficult. We were lucky to get out of Boston at all. This is all we were allowed to bring with us. As for the rest, the house and the furnishings, well, the soldiers of the Tories have no doubt looted the place already. But if Papa hadn't run, he would have faced arrest for his activities. Only Dr. Warren insisted on remaining behind and Paul Revere to coordinate spying on the troops. What about Mr. Eads? The last I heard, he was starting to dismantle his press. He hopes to smuggle the pieces and what he needs to Watertown. He and the others are concerned about money. 
I do not understand, Anne. Why money? The printing of it. Or didn't that occur to you? What is the matter with you? This came for you. I kept it with your things. A private courier brought it to the door only hours before we left. I shouldn't have opened it, but under the circumstances. It's from his wife. Alicia? She wants you to come to her. In Philadelphia. She says it's urgent. Anne, I have no interest in anything she might have to say, urgent or otherwise. I have no reason to see her. How do you know? Because anything between us is dead now. If you lay with her, Philip, if you shared her bed, how do you know there isn't something very much alive between the two of you? A child? Your father had a bastard, why not you? Does she say that? No, but you don't deny it's possible. You don't deny you took her the way he said you did. Why, Philip? Because you had to have everything that belonged to him? Because you had to prove you were his equal? Anne, please. It's always been with you, hasn't it? That need is what kept you from ever finding me good enough to share a life with. You still want all those dreams your mother spun for you. You want to be a nobleman. To have what they have, possess what they possess. Anne, stop it. It's true. Admit it. You want everything your brother had. Even his wife. You are going. And I've gone through most of my life not knowing who I am. Not who I really am or where I fit into this world. But if I fathered a child, a child will never know the doubts that I've known. What if I told you? What? Nothing. Safe journey? Do you understand? Yes. I'll be back. I suppose that's really one more thing you can't know about yourself now, Philip. But if you find out it's what you want, I'll be here. No. Jason and a private bath. Well, there must be some mistake, sir. I, I need only one room. A small one. Well, quite the contrary to Lady Amberley's instructions, sir. She said the finest. These are our finest. How much? Well, that's been taken care of, Mr. Kent, for the length of your stay. Why, I do not expect to be staying very long, sir. Uh, to the contrary again, sir, but then, as I said, the lady is taking care of everything. Uh, is there any further assistance I can provide? No. Thank you. This, uh, well, the, the room is quite adequate. Thank you very much. As you say, sir. Oh, one thing. Sir? Did Lady Amberley say where she could be reached? I believe she intends to contact you, sir, at her earliest convenience. I see. Well, thank you, then. Your servant, sir.
Hold me. You're still the way I remembered. Your letter said it was urgent. Yes. I had to know you were all right. I had to see you. But you're really here. And there's nothing to ever keep us apart again. Now that Roger is dead, you mean? You know? Well, apparently, there is something you do not know. I killed him. You? Of course. I might have guessed. So why did you send for me? I've lived through hell, Philippe. It was unbearable with him. And I... I looked elsewhere, as I told you I'd have to. But every man I turned to, every man I tried to love, failed me. They were never you, Philippe. Don't ever let me go again. It was you who let me go. Where are those French ways? You haven't even told me you've missed me a little. There is something I must ask you. Have there been children? Children? No. Why? Is that it? You thought I'd born you a child? No, Philippe. You fathered no children yet. At least not that I know of. But then, of course, you must have had other relationships since we were last together. Is there anyone in particular? Yes, there is. Oh? In Boston? She is waiting for me now. But when it comes to waiting, Master Frenchman, I'm at the head of the line. And I demand my turn to sway your persuasions. Now. Please, yeah. Tell me you've forgotten how it was. Tell me. Tell me. Alicia. No, I, I have not forgotten. The nights you've dreamed why you were born, Philippe. You should have known you were born to share my bed. Alicia. All the dreams you've ever had, all the things you've ever wanted, they're not dreams anymore, Philippe. They're real. As real as I am. Very beautiful. And you are in the hands of Bacchus. No, Alicia. I'm in your hands. Beautiful hands. Lovely, lovely hands. Loving hands. Also. Oh, yes, ma'am. Alicia, please. You don't like it? Well, it is not that I do not like it. It is just that I could never possibly wear them all. Twice. What? You may never wear them all twice. But then a man in your position doesn't have to, darling. And one in the deep green as well. Oh, most assuredly, Lady Amberley. Absolutely right, Philippe. You're much more appealing in your natural state. 
That will be all, Martin. Go ahead inside. I'll be along shortly. Oh, you have something more important to attend to? I thought I might like to see how the rest of the world was doing. Boston. And England. And France. And even this fair town of Philadelphia for all we've seen of it before today. Don't be long. Your copy of the Boston Gazette. There's only one, and it's over six weeks old. I believe we are acquainted, are we not? Well, Dr. Franklin, warmest greetings to you, sir. Well, you're looking splendid, Master Charbonneau. Quite splendid indeed. Thank you very much, sir. Can the printing trade be doing so well by you in such a short time? Well, I, I have had a bit of good fortune of late. It would appear, Monsieur Charbonneau, it would appear. If you tell me that my letter of introduction admitted you to so fine a position as your tailor would indicate, <laughs> I may be of a mind to go home and write one for myself. Well, your letter was very much appreciated, sir, as I trust you know. Oh, by the way, I, I've taken a name, an American name here, Philip Kent. Kent, huh? Philip Kent. Yes, has a good Yankee ring to it. Am I to presume, then, that you've decided to take up residence here in Philadelphia? No, sir, in Boston. Well, that is until recently. As you know, the situation there has been rather uncertain. And the man I was working for, he, he's now relocating. A Mr. Eads. Of Eads and Gill. My, Ben Eads at that. Then you are just the young man I want to see. I've been thumbing through the pages of this gazette, but as I said before, it's six weeks old. How long since you left? Less than three weeks, sir. Oh, then will you walk a while with me? I've had no news from Boston but rumors of late, and I want to see how things stand. I would be most honored, sir. Good. Come, let us walk, eh? So the flames burn hotter. Well, Mr. Adams says it would lead to war. He even seems to want it. The others? But the city stands divided, sir. Even some of the Sons of Liberty question the wisdom of total independence. And you? Well, my opinion is hardly important, sir. Contrary. If war comes, it'll be young men like yourself who'll have to shoulder the muskets on both sides. Where will you stand then, huh? I do not know, sir. Mugwump. I beg your pardon, sir. Mugwump. The Algonquin Indians call their leaders muckwumps. But we have altered the word a bit in contemporary politics and made it mug ones. But it is not a leader to us. It's a new breed of bird who sits on a fence with his mug on one side and his wump on the other. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, this new breed may soon become extinct. A bird sitting on a fence is bound to catch a ball in the crossfire when the shooting starts. Well, then where do you stand, Dr. Franklin? Well, I'm not at all certain that war will succeed. At best, only a fraction of the population will support armed hostilities. No matter what their dedication, they will be only untrained farmers pitted against regiments which have distinguished themselves in battlefields the world over. Well, then you stand opposed. No, I am persuaded it's the only road we can travel. Toward independence? Yes. But this time, America will be a little more than just a bastard child 
thrust into the world alone and unprotected, exposed to countless risks that the more timid and the more secure would never experience. A kind of independence, Philip, that can be forged into an existence infinitely stronger and weaker in the normal course of life. Yes, I think I can understand that, sir. I am a bastard myself. I know. That is one of the reasons I counseled you to come to America. We are all bastards here, Philip. Of English blood, but denied our heritage by a crown who refuses to recognize us as a rightful son. If only someone in German George's court would stand up to him. But they won't do it. Not North, not Dartmouth, not Kentland. Well, what's the matter, lad? You're white as ashes. You said Kentland? Yes, James Amberley, the Duke of Kentland. He's the Assistant Secretary for Overseas Affairs. Yes, I know who he is, sir. But you say he's alive? Well, I can't speak for today, but he certainly was when I sailed. He spoke outside the House of Lords. But they told us he died, sir. They said he was dead. Lady Amberley, her son Roger. You know about them and about me. Not too difficult a task. From our conversation in London and what Solomon Sholto told me about your leaving and your new name, Philip Kent. <laughs> Damn them. Philip. Don't hate them all. Not your father. I have a bastard son myself, and I love him nonetheless for his illegitimacy. Yes, but my mother died because of what they did. I doubt that the Duke knew that. Aside from his blind loyalty to the King, he's a wise and humane man in all respects. I am once again in your debt, Doctor. The choice we've been discussing. You've made mine a very easy one. It can't be an easy one. Not for any of us. But it may be necessary to survive, to know who we are, and what we are to become. And how goes the world with which you were so concerned? A bit troubled. It needn't trouble us. You're very beautiful, Alicia. Flattery, my lord, leads to who knows what. You're truly an incredible woman. I warn you, sir. A tongue like that makes a woman all too vulnerable. Philippe. Philip. Yes, Philip. My Philip. Was it as easy the first time, Alicia? What? The reeds at the door of Kentland, the shocked looks of the servants, the uh, pretended show of grief. Was it as easy to buy all of that as it's been to buy me? Philippe. Philip. All of this, Alicia. These rooms, the, the clothes, the satin quilts, the wine, the smell of your perfume. All this time with a woman so warm and willing that I could not possibly think of anything or anyone but her. This is a world I've never known, Alicia. A very, very powerful world. Wealth and title. They can buy anything, can they not? Or at least blind those of us who have never had them to the truth. You spoke of Kentland. Of the Duke's death. Yes, I did. Then you found out. Yes, Alicia. I finally found out. Oh, I'm so glad. I didn't know how to ever tell you what happened, how it happened. And you don't hate me. Hate you. All of the pieces of my life have finally fallen into place. Now, how could I possibly hate you for helping that to happen? Oh, my darling, I was so frightened. So afraid you wouldn't understand. Understand? Alicia. Of course I understand. Then we can go to London tomorrow, together with the letter. The letter? From your father. The proof that his estate is rightfully yours. My father would never honor that letter now, Alicia. Not when he learns how Roger died. He doesn't have to know that. You mean he is as easily deceived as I have been? Well, 
Perhaps that is more proof in our relation than the letter would have been anyway. You don't have it. We still have each other, Alicia. You've destroyed it? It nearly destroyed me. Philippe, tell me the truth. The truth. The truth, my dear beautiful Alicia, is that I am a fool. And you are a whore. Troops are on the road to Concord. Blanker companies from different regiments. All those already armed remain here. The rest of you get your muskets and reassemble here as quickly as possible. We still have supplies to be moved. We need every hand we can get. Now set to. Ah, uh, Kent. Sir. Are we going out to fetch your musket? Aye, sir. Good. I need someone to stop at every farm along the North Road. Make sure all have heard the bells. Speed them on the way. I can count on you? You can, sir. Colonel Barrett. I thought that was you. So you're back from Philadelphia? Yes, sir. Is Anne inside? What you did, what you must have said before you left, brought her as much grief as I've ever seen. She refused to give me any details except to tell me there was nothing more between you two, so you go on, carry out your orders, and don't ever try to see her again. Mr. Ware, I said leave her be! She wanted to protect you. I remember her mother this way. The white look on her face, the smells of weakness in the morning. And this with child? So I have to see her. I'll use it, Kent. If you even try to see her again. Kent! Damn it, get going! Now that's an order! Yes, sir! Mr. Revere. Do you know him? Aye. From Boston. And the high son of liberty, too. You came up the post road? Aye, sir, I did. Any sign of redcoats? Well, no, sir, not. There's a detachment abroad. We've no wish to run afoul of them. Aye, lad. We're riding express to give the alarm. Last night, light infantry and grenadiers started slipping aboard boats on the back bay. We might have been surprised, too, but one of our lads found two mongrels bayoneted on the streets. To prevent them from barking. But thanks to Mr. Revere and Mr. Dawes, their expedition is a secret no longer. If you're still with the militia, you'd best get to your unit. British. Away! And Godspeed! Gentlemen, may we crave your names? Paul Revere from Boston. Revere! Gentlemen, we have made a fortunate catch. And who are your friends, sir? They may speak or not as they choose. They bloody well better speak or we'll blow their damned heads off. 
Dr. Prescott of Concord. Dawes of Boston. Kent, Boston. Kent. There's a warrant out on this one. Aiding a deserter and suspicion of murder. Follow us across the draw, sir. And Mr. Revere, we have heard of your excellent horsemanship. So you'll take your hands off your reins and let your horse walk. Here we are, off to fight against the Crown, and we're leaving a Tommy to care for the farm. Well, I'd feel much better if we had a spare musket or two, sir. Now, don't you worry, Sergeant. If the Grenadiers get this far, there are plenty of sickles and size in the barn. And a loft you can use to drop down on them by surprise. By God, you can count on it. What about me? you will be riding with us to Concord. If there's to be marauding, it's best you're in company. Lucas, let's saddle the horses. Yes, I... I tried to see Anne in the village, but her father would not permit it. Tell me truthfully, Daisy, is she with child? Yes, sir. I'm sure it's true. Will you give her a message for me? I'll try, sir. In case... in case we do not return, tell her... tell her that she has my love. Yes, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you, Daisy. Oh, and thank you for bringing my things. Find my freedom, Lucas. Sir? You met my mother on the road to Bristol. Aye, she was sick. She was tormented all of her life by a fear of poverty. She once told me that the greatest crime a man could commit is living in poverty, dying in obscurity. 
She made me vow to her that I would never do that. That vow sold me into slavery. You are bound to no man. No, not to a man, but to a way of life. My mother was wrong, Lucas. Living in bondage to another person's principles, another person's values. Bondage of the body, bondage of the soul, it doesn't matter which. That is the greatest crime a man can commit. For it is a crime against himself that destroys his own identity, even his own worth. That's freedom, sir. Now, if you're ready to defend it, your horse is saddled, Mr. O'Brien is waiting. And I thought you might want this. It's a little old, but it's warm. Are you sure you will not need it? Well, a man doesn't need more than one cord at a time, sir. No. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Concord. The commander's headquartered at Wright's Tavern. The soldiers are going from house to house. Has there been fighting? Not when I left. The troops are on one side of the bridge, and our militia is forming a line to hold them there. We better get to Colonel Barrett. Daisy, you stay here with Mr. Swear. Anna, Anna, I tried to see you. My father told me. Why did you ever let me go? You had to go, Philip. But oh, how I prayed you'd come back. Why didn't you tell me about the baby? I almost did. But I couldn't use that to hold you. Anne. I love you. I love you. Ken. Yes, sir. Annie, men will die today on both sides. God knows what the future will bring for any of us. Or what I can promise you. But if I come back, and if you'll have me. Yes, Philip. Yes. Sir. One of a rare breed of men. Men who were free-spirited individuals who called themselves Americans and marched together to create a nation that would guarantee life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> 